my name is Julius Horvat. I am from the Department of Economics and Department of International Relations. And I'm happy to welcome you all here. You know, it's one of the first uh, okay, public events uh, this year at the Central European University. And typically public events at Central European University have a good and excellent quality. And I think that will be also uh, your impression, hopefully, after the, today's meeting. We have a very distinguished guest, uh, one of the eminent commentators and journalists from the United States, Robert Kuttner. The program is, uh, we run for 90 minutes. Uh, first, I give word to the rector and president of the Central European University to introduce the speaker. Then the speech goes 50, 60 minutes, and there is almost half hour for questions. Please ask three questions. All questions are good. Only answers can be wrong. Thank you. <laughs> Please, the rector of the Central European University. Thank you very much, Julius, and, and welcome to all of you, I, those of you who are still trying to find your, not only your seats, but maybe even your housing in Budapest. We, uh, we welcome you very much here. Um, there are some more seats in the front, so please come down. They say reserved on them, but they're reserved for you, so come on down here. Uh, and we may, we may have to add a few more chairs. Um, We've, we've met here rather than the, in the auditorium uh, because it was much more convenient for a variety of reasons and also we're filming this, uh, this event. Um, so uh, let me say a few words of introduction about uh, tonight's lecture, which as Yulia says is the, uh, really the inaugural event, lecture event, uh, certainly in the economics department. Uh, and in a number of departments uh, across the university as we begin our 20th anniversary year, which is the 20th year of CEU's uh, existence. So it's a very exciting year, and it's a very appropriate year, I think, for us to launch with the kinds of events that we're going to be having uh, here this fall. Um, tonight's lecture is, of course, on the economic crisis and its political consequences in the United States in particular, uh, the Obama presidency and the political economy of austerity. And uh, it will be delivered by uh, one of our foremost uh, commentators on American political economy, uh, Robert Kuttner, who's uh, someone I've known for many years and admired uh, for many years. And actually, he's also been my publisher on several occasions in his, uh, his magazine, which I will describe to you in a minute. But before introducing uh, Bob at any greater length, let me just say a few words about the background of this lecture. This lecture comes uh, at the end of a remarkable three-day international conference, which was actually held right here in this room, uh, on the economic crisis and the crisis in economics. And for those of you who are uh, studying economics, you may be aware that uh, there is a lot of ferment and discussion about what, in fact, uh, economics is all about. And it's hardly surprising because the the doctrine, the prevailing doctrine uh, that has uh, really been at the center of the study of economic uh, issues over the last uh, 25 years, the doctrine of rational expectations and rational behavior in markets, um, is a doctrine which became, which became uh, very seriously unraveled and called into question in light of the, the crisis. There are, as came out in the conference that we just had, four basic tenets of this prevailing doctrine. Um, first, that markets are rational. A second, that regulation is counterproductive. Third, that most economic problems are self-correcting. And fourth, that perhaps the only problem that may not be self-correcting is deficit spending, which is spending when you don't have the money to spend it, uh, and therefore deficit spending may need to be curtailed at the government level by government austerity measures. Now those are four basic tenets of this prevailing doctrine. And I think in many ways the best way to illustrate the doctrine and why it may have led to the financial crisis is to quote to you from a wonderful letter uh, that was sent by the British Academy 
to the Queen of England in July of 2009. Now, you may wonder why was the British Academy writing to the Queen of England? Well, the Queen of England, in a meeting with uh, a large number of economists at the London School of Economics, asked a rather pointed question. And she said, why had nobody noticed that the credit crunch was on its way? Well, the answer that came about nine months later, which is a, a very wonderful gestation period for a letter of this kind, from the best and brightest in many ways sort of economists who were uh, subscribers to the doctrine that I've just described to you, uh, it came this way. Uh, I'll just quote a few uh, relevant passages from it. First, most experts, the letter said, were convinced that banks knew what they were doing. They believed that the financial wizards had found new and clever ways of managing risk. Uh, nobody wanted to believe that their judgment could be faulty or that they were unable competently to scrutinize the risks in the organizations they managed. This created, in turn, the difficulties of slowing the progression of such developments in the presence of a general feel-good factor. Uh, there was a broad consensus that it was better to deal with the aftermath of financial bubbles in stock markets and housing markets than to try to head them off in advance. Inflation remained low and created no warning sign of an economy that was overheating. So, in summary, Your Majesty reads this wonderful letter. The failure to foresee the timing, extent, and severity of the crisis and to head it off, while it had many causes, was principally a failure of the collective imagination of many bright people, both in this country and internationally, to understand the risks to the system as a whole. Uh, I, I don't think there is a better explanation of what happened in many respects than, than what the British Academy told the Queen. Um, and I'm kind of reminded of the, uh, of the young boy who had just learned to ride his bicycle uh, and he suddenly decided to take his hands off the handlebars of the bicycle. And of course, uh, just as he was saying to his mother, look, ma, no hands, he crashed. Uh, so I think that may be, in a sense, what was going on in this situation. Now, I'm going to shift and, and introduce our speaker. Uh, but I'll introduce him by, by telling you uh, in essence, what it is we're going to be probing here tonight. Uh, Barack Obama, as you know, was elected president of the United States just after the crash was happening. Uh, how is he doing two years later? A very interesting and very important question, especially as he approaches uh, midterm elections in November. What are the policies he was trying to uh, use to put the economy back together again? What are the political constraints he has faced in doing so? And what are the prospects for recovery? That is really the topic of tonight's lecture. And uh, my friend and longtime analyst of the US political economy, uh, Bob Kuttner, is the ideal person to tell you about this. Bob is the co-editor of the American Prospect magazine, the co-founder of the Economic Policy Institute, uh, a former columnist for Business Week and the national staff writer for the Washington Post. Uh, he's also a former chief investigator of the Banking Committee of the United States Senate. And he's the author of nine books, the best known of which is Everything for Sale, The Virtue, Virtues and Limits of Markets, published in 1997. Uh, his latest book, uh, published this year, is A Presidency in Peril, a study of the Obama administration's first year in office. He's taught at Brandeis, uh, at uh, Boston University, and at Harvard's Institute of Politics. And Bob, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to see you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to try and get some more chairs uh, moved in here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks to John, to Julius, uh, and uh, once again to George Soros, whose uh, benevolence and uh, foresight uh, underwrote the Institute for New Economic Thinking, which, as John mentioned, uh, just uh, sponsored a, a wonderful 
uh, three-day conference uh, here at the Central University, uh, European University on the crisis of the economy and in, in economic thinking. Well, like many uh, Americans and citizens of the world's other nations, I was enormously heartened when Barack Obama uh, arrived on the political scene. Here was a fresh, uh, young outsider who could rekindle faith in the political process and in public institutions, especially on the part of young people. Uh, here was an antidote to the swagger of his uh, immediate predecessor, someone who could uh, pursue a foreign policy based more on the soft power, so-called, of America's new, uh, renewed moral authority and benevolent purpose in the world. Here was a biracial, and in some ways a post-racial politician with empathy for blacks and whites, Christians, Muslims, Jews, <clears throat> and non-believers who might detoxify the subjects, the loaded subjects of religion and race. It was certainly the most hopeful political moment <clears throat> in my adulthood, uh, maybe in my lifetime. Uh, I was in high school when John Kennedy was elected. And uh, he was also an intellectual of all things, a president of the United States who was serious about ideas, who at the age of 33 had written a quite remarkable book himself, not written by a ghostwriter, about his own uh, odyssey. His campaign enlisted 13 million volunteers, many of them young. He won the support of first-time voters by a margin of 71% to 29%, uh, uh, a record. He carried an overwhelming majority of political independence. He won states that Democrats just don't win, like North Carolina and uh, Indiana. Uh, the Democrats picked up 24 seats in the House, eight in the Senate. So he began his term as one of the few Democrats since World War II with a governing majority. And on January 20th, Inauguration Day, his approval rating was uh, upwards of 70% because Americans wanted him to succeed because the success of the recovery of the economy was dependent upon Barack Obama's success. And of course, he had a rendezvous with the worst economic crisis uh, since the Great Depression. I was heartened uh, not just as an American citizen, but as a liberal Democrat. Obama displayed a superb facility for framing progressive ideas as reassuringly patriotic. In his keynote address to the 2004 convention of the Democratic Party, uh, the one that included his now famous speech about not wanting red states or blue states, but wanting the United States of America, uh, a speech that instantly established him even before he was elected to the United States Senate as a national contender for the presidency. Obama also said this, he said, if there's a child on the south side of Chicago who can't read, that matters to me, even if it's not my child. If there's a senior citizen somewhere who can't pay for her prescription and has to choose between the medicine and the rent, that makes my life poorer, even if it's not my grandmother. If there's an Arab American family being rounded up without benefit of an attorney or due process of law, that threatens my civil liberties. It's that fundamental belief I am my brother's keeper I am my sister's keeper that makes this country work. It's what allows us to pursue our individual dreams, yet still come together as a single American family. It had been a long time since we had heard such courage and such uh, eloquence. If Obama heartened liberals, it was also because here was a black man who had lived the American dream, a man whose own life experience was exemplary as a husband, a father, a scholar, and a community leader. And when the extended Obama family was introduced to the Democratic National Convention in 2008, this was a family of strivers far more evocative of the American dream than the McCain family. It was an all-American family that just happened to be an African-American family. The possibility that the Obamas could be America's first family suggested a degree of racial healing that many of us thought we would never see in our lifetimes. And then came the financial crisis. And with it, opportunities and stakes and risks that only grew. The crisis disgraced the ideology of laissez-faire. 
It disgraced the idea that all financial innovations are benevolent. It disgraced the speculative practices of Wall Street that brought down the economy, and it provided a practical verdict on the policies of the previous administration. It weakened the candidacy of the Republican, John McCain. So in principle, here was a Roosevelt moment for a transformative president with the support of the people and the urgency of events to bring about sweeping change and to usher in an era of durable progressive reform comparable to Roosevelt's New Deal. Or at least some of us convinced ourselves uh, that this was possible. Uh, I wrote a book called Obama's Challenge. It was published in August of 2008, after Obama won the Democratic nomination, but before he was elected. Uh, I took a slight gamble. Uh, my publisher took it with me. We said we'd either have a bestseller or we'd have a big fire. Uh, but uh, Obama was, in fact, elected. And I meant Obama's challenge in both senses of the word. His challenge to the political system and the challenge that events uh, would present to him with a deepening economic crisis. And uh, in that book, I warned that just like Roosevelt, uh, Obama would face an undertow of bad advice and the efforts of Republicans and conservative Democrats uh, to block his program and of Wall Street to use its influence to block serious financial reform. But I still felt that he had a very good chance to succeed because this rare moment uh, was a rendezvous between a serious crisis and a remarkable young leader. And in the book, I pointed out how other crises had either made or broken presidencies. Uh, you could point to Lincoln and the devastating crisis of the Civil War, which he turned into a moment of real greatness. You could point to Roosevelt and uh, the tragedy and the horror of the Great Depression, which he surmounted and became one of the greatest presidents ever. Or you could point to Hoover, Herbert Hoover, uh, whose presidency was destroyed by the Depression. Or you could point to uh, Jimmy Carter, who had a great post-presidency, but who failed to rise to the occasion of uh, the crisis that he faced. So I think in American history, a crisis either makes a presidency uh, or destroyed, destroys a presidency. And of course, even before the collapse of uh, the fall of 2008, all was not well with the American economy. It had been 30 years since uh, the last period of stable economic growth. And since the uh, mid-1970s, really, you had an economy where uh, earnings, median wages, were diverging from productivity growth, where the gains were increasingly going to the top, where risks were being shifted to uh, individual uh, workers and, uh, and their families and where the economy was becoming more and more financialized. Uh, the economist Simon Johnson, the former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, calculated that in the first two years after World War II, the percentage of overall profits in the American economy that went to banks and other uh, financial institutions was 10 or 12 percent. Uh, by 2006, the last year before the crash, it was 41 percent. And you have to ask whether financial institutions added that much value to the American economy. Most people would say that they mainly added enrichment for themselves and risks for everyone else. And the crisis was certainly uh, the proof of that proposition. Uh, we had an economy with a hollowing out of manufacturing where uh, people, individuals, households compensated for stagnant wages <coughs> by uh, taking on more and more debt. Uh, incomes were not going up with the cost of living, but asset prices were. So you could borrow against your house. And uh, you could uh, use what a colleague of mine calls the plastic safety net, the credit card. Consumer debt reached record proportions uh, in the early 2000s. And the percentage of equity in one's home uh, relative to the total value of the house went into a dramatic decline because more and more people were borrowing uh, against their homes to finance uh, the cost of, uh, of living. And um, in the period 
uh, of the Greenspan uh, chairmanship of the, Fe of the Federal Reserve, you had one financial crisis after another, which Chairman Greenspan responded to by lowering interest rates. Now, some critics argue that the policy of reducing interest rates was a bad policy. I would qualify that in one very important respect. Uh, low interest rates are good for the economy. They lower the cost of capital for productive investment. The disastrous error that Greenspan and his colleagues committed was not lowering interest rates. It was lowering interest rates and then coupling that with extreme deregulation. So there was no control on leverage. There was uh, no real regulation of capital asset ratios. And of course, banks and shadow banks uh, simply used those very low interest rates uh, to uh, bor borrow short term in money markets and speculate. And uh, when it all started unwinding, it cra crashed with an abruptness that most uh, mainstream economists did not anticipate. However, there were lots of dissenting voices among economists, uh, among journalists, uh, even on the part of one governor of the Board of uh, Governors uh, of the Federal Reserve. Because obviously, you, you did not need a Nobel Prize in economics to understand that subprime was an unsustainable system. Think about it. You had people whose distinguishing characteristic was that they had bad credit ratings. And then you uh, lent them money with no documentation. This was known in the industry as liar loans. Now you ask the question, why would a bank make such a loan? And the answer is that it had an investment bank working with it that was happy to turn that loan into a security. And it had a corrupted credit rating agency also working with it that was happy to turn that uh, security into a bond with a AAA rating. And so this machine of turning out bad loans uh, to, uh, to unqualified people and uh, passing along the paper uh, just became like the, the fable of the sorcerer's apprentice. And uh, you had second and third and fourth order securities that were piled onto these dubious loans. Uh, subprime loans by themselves we're only about a, a trillion two, a trillion three. It's a lot of money, but it shouldn't be enough money to crash the whole economy. But um, they were in turn leveraged at 30 or 40 to one. Uh, and that starts to be, uh, to be serious money. And the people who were supposed to be regulating all of this just decided that financial markets uh, must have known what they were doing. Uh, innovation was blessed as something that was automatically a good thing. It was Paul Volcker who said that the only truly useful financial innovation in the past uh, 30 years was the ATM machine. And uh, he, uh, he was probably right. So you had this economy that was just riding for a fall. And the economy, in turn, was based upon uh, an extreme version of uh, pre-Keynesian classical economics, which taught that uh, economies were self-regulating and that uh, the interference of the state uh, could only make things worse. Uh, Warren Buffett once said, uh, the, the, the billionaire uh, investor, of course, uh, you never know who is swimming naked until the tide goes out. And uh, when the tide went out, it turned out that uh, a lot of people uh, were swimming naked. Um, so the crash comes. Uh, the uh, Bush administration, in the person of Hank Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, Ben Bernanke, uh, Chairman of the Fed, and Timothy Geithner, then the President of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, scrambles. They fashion ad hoc rescues to keep uh, the biggest banks in the system from going under. They finally realize that they can't do this anymore without some money from Congress. Uh, they go to Congress. Uh, they call together the leaders of Congress, and they warn that if Congress doesn't give them about a trillion dollars by the next morning, uh, the whole economy will collapse. Congress didn't quite believe that. They took about two and a half weeks, uh, and they did come up with $700 billion. And it was in this period that Obama basically won the election. This was in October. The election was in November. Because Obama, who was a complete novice to politics, uh, came across as more seasoned, more reliable, more judicious than McCain. 
McCain had tried this ploy of suspending his campaign so he could come back to Washington and help broker this bailout legislation, but in the event, played no role whatsoever, uh, whereas Obama played a fairly active role. And in that critical week where the economy was just on the brink of collapsing and the stock market was in free fall, uh, about 10% of American voters made up their minds and opted for Obama. Well, here we are 22 months later on the eve of uh, another election, and uh, the question is, how is Obama doing, and how is the economy doing? And I think the answer to both questions has to be not well enough. Uh, when Obama was elected, many of us expected a Roosevelt-scale break uh, with the old order, uh, as well as a political realignment and a dethroning of the ideology of laissez-faire and a demonstration once again that you needed a managed form of capitalism in which government was needed to provide practical help as well as stabilization. But uh, oddly, uh, instead of making a radical break with Bush's team and a radical break uh, with the old order, uh, Obama began by appointing uh, the same Tim Geithner as Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, he followed that up by appointing, uh, reappointing Ben Bernanke as uh, chair of the Fed. And then he appointed Lawrence Summers to head his economic team, the same man who was the principal architect of deregulation under the previous uh, Democratic administration uh, of Bill Clinton. And there has been a real continuity in the policy of how you go about uh, rescuing banks. While these policies did avert a second Great Depression, um, the economy has bifurcated. Wall Street has recovered very nicely. Uh, its executives are still making uh, huge bonuses, but uh, Main Street has not recovered, and Obama may well pay the political price. And there was a very important debate in January and February and March of 2009 about what to do about the banks. This was absolutely emblematic <laughs> to uh, the way Obama went about rescuing the economy. On one side of the debate, <clears throat> you had uh, Geithner and Summers and Bernanke. And on the other side of the debate, you had one insider, the chairwoman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, Sheila Baer, and several outsiders, such as uh, Joseph Stiglitz and Paul Krugman, uh, Nouriel Roubini, Paul Volcker, me, uh, and uh, some other commentators. And the debate went something like this. Is it better to uh, pretend that several of the largest banks in the system are not insolvent when in fact they are insolvent and just give them money and use uh, either the Federal Reserve or the Treasury with appropriated taxpayer money to take bad assets off their books and guarantee uh, uh, securities against default and muddle through and hope that economic growth and time save you? Or is it better to do a real audit of just how bad things are at these institutions and figure out how big the hole is and figure out who takes the loss? How much of the loss goes to bondholders, stockholders would be wiped out, and how much of the loss uh, is paid for by the taxpayers? And then you have a successor institution that is uh, sound in terms of its balance sheet. Now, uh, with smaller banks that fail, this is what the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation does. Does it many times in the course of a year. But with a very big bank, a trillion dollar bank, there was great nervousness on the part of Summers and Geithner and Bernanke about doing this with Citigroup. So instead, they just threw money at Citigroup, $45 billion uh, in programs that they made up as they went along, and another $302 billion uh, in assets that the government guaranteed against default. Basically, there were two prior examples of these two models of how to proceed. One was uh, Japan, which followed a, a muddle through uh, policy and paid dearly in the form of more than a decade of lost growth because banks with damaged balance sheets kept dragging down the rest of the economy. The other example was Sweden in the early 1990s, which faced uh, initially a run on its currency, 
because of the, uh, the relationship of the Swedish krona to the Deutschmark. And um, uh, eventually this took down uh, one, one of its biggest banks and uh, other banks were on the verge of insolvency. And the Swedish government uh, pursued the kind of policy that the critics were recommending. It went in, it did a comprehensive assessment of just how bad the damage was. It took the biggest bank into receivership, cleaned it up, put in some public money, and then returned it to private ownership. And Sweden recovered fairly quickly from a very severe uh, banking crisis. So <clears throat> I think the, the first mistake that he made that we are still paying for was the way they dealt with the banking crisis. A related mistake was not to use this moment of crisis as leverage for financial reform. There was a financial reform bill passed more than a year later, but by that point the banks had recovered their political influence and the reforms were not nearly, in my view anyway, as sweeping as they needed to be because more than anything else, the financial industry needed drastic simplification so that it would not be so big and so interconnected and so unfathomable that banks would not only be uh, too big to fail, but they'd be too complex to understand and too interconnected to disturb. Uh, there was a moment when we could have had drastic uh, simplification of the financial system, but uh, the moment passed. So, as a consequence uh, of the banking crisis and um, this downward spiral of uh, high unemployment, uh, businesses uh, not seeing customers and businesses not investing, banks being uh, risk averse, uh, we are in a situation uh, very much like the one that Britain and America faced uh, in the 1930s where uh, GDP growth has turned positive, but uh, because of this vicious circle, we are stuck in uh, what Keynes called uh, an underemployment equilibrium, and we don't seem as if we're going to get out of that uh, anytime soon. The budget deficit is uh, around 9% of GDP. Uh, U.S. unemployment is stuck around... Uh, uh, 10 percent. It's more like 17 percent if you measure it right and count people who want full-time jobs but can't find them. It's closer to 21 or 22 percent if you count people who are out of the labor force because uh, they've given up or because they're in prison. Um, and most of the government deficit is the result of tax receipts uh, being reduced in a recession, not because of deliberate stimulus spending. It's a passive deficit, if you will, uh, not a strategic active deficit. The Federal Reserve has reduced interest rates to just above zero and is still purchasing uh, depressed securities from banks and from the government itself. Uh, the government has now guaranteed the financing of all new mortgages in the economy, but we are still not generating enough jobs to reduce the unemployment rate. and. Um, the usual policy levers don't seem to be working. We have the additional problem of having to rely on foreign borrowing to finance our public debt and some of our private investments. And to make matters worse, uh, many voices are now calling for an austerity program of reduced spending and reduced deficits to reassure bond markets long before the economy is in full recovery, which of course would worsen uh, the recession. Now, all of these dilemmas have their counterparts in Europe, which I'll come back to in a few minutes uh, with, uh, with different particulars. The, um, the New York Times has taken to calling this uh, the Great Recession, uh, evoking the Great Depression, but only less so. Um, I'm not sure that's the right description, because if you think about it, uh, a recession by definition is a fairly mild and transient downturn that will be cured either by self-correcting mechanisms or by fairly modest government intervention. Uh, so a great recession is a contradiction in terms. Um, technically, a recession ends when positive GDP growth returns, and yet we've had positive GDP growth for many months now, and yet this uh, sub-full employment equilibrium is 
uh, by no means on the road to, uh, to being cured. In the Great Depression, uh, growth was positive, quite, quite dramatically positive, for most of uh, that decade after 1933, and yet unemployment remained stuck uh, well above 10% until World War II. Now, I don't want to call it a Great Depression II. I think that's too depressing. But I think we might call it the Great Stagnation. Um, so actually, in some ways, you could say that the crisis is more serious than that of the 1930s, at least in the United States, because after 1933, the banking crisis was over. Uh, no federally insured bank failed after 1934. And Roosevelt also had and used aggressively uh, a Reconstruction Finance Corporation to help recapitalize banks and other strategic enterprises. He had a homeowner's loan corporation to refinance distressed mortgages at the government's own borrowing rate. And the Depression continued, but not because of a weakened financial sector. And also, the United States was a creditor nation uh, in those years, not a debtor nation. So you have two factors now that are very serious that are aggravating the crisis uh, that you didn't have uh, even in uh, the 1930s. Well, not surprisingly, the voters uh, are discouraged, and Obama's popularity has fallen. Uh, the Democrats are likely to lose substantial numbers of seats in both houses of Congress in the midterm election 55 days from now. Uh, they could lose control of, uh, of one or more houses, which would make it even more difficult for Obama to enact uh, an effective recovery program. Now, I am not quite as uh, pessimistic as some uh, for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, Obama has begun to challenge uh, Republican obstruction. He's begun to sound a little bit more like a partisan. In the past few days, uh, he has said that uh, when the Bush tax cuts expire, uh, at the end of this year, he's going to extend them for households that earn less than $250,000, but he's not going to extend them for the wealthy. Uh, he has put forward a large program of uh, credits and uh, loans, tax credits for small business, and uh, he's just announced a $50 billion uh, infrastructure program. Now, I don't know if any of these are going to pass because the Republican tactic of blocking everything that he does will continue, but at least he's trying to smoke out the difference between the Republican view uh, and his own view. That's a sign of life. That's a sign of political health. I was, I was quite worried that he was being almost too professorial, too aloof, too diffident, but this is a man who hates to lose, and this is a man who has come from behind and uh, defied the critics uh, before. Uh, my guess is that the Democrats will probably lose 20 to 30 seats in the House uh, and uh, maybe five in the Senate. But that's very serious because his governing majority is really only about 10 or 15 seats. There are conservative Democrats who have voted against uh, all of his major uh, initiatives. Now, the question I want to pose uh, in the remainder of this talk is, was the path that Obama's team pursued uh, the best course economically? I think it wasn't. Uh, I think he could have uh, chosen a bigger stimulus. If you look at the stimulus package that was enacted in February of 2009, uh, nominally it was $775 billion. That sounds like a huge amount of money. It is a huge amount of money. But you have to offset that in two respects. First of all, uh, that money is, is paid out, most of it over three years, some of it into year four and five. And secondly, it's offset by about $460 billion of retrenchment in state and local government budgets. So the net federal stimulus is maybe, maybe $100 billion a year in a $15 trillion economy. Not, not enough money uh, to make a serious difference. Uh, was the path that he chose the only path that was available politically? Well, that's a complicated question that deserves a complicated answer. It's true that the Republicans probably would have blocked a more aggressive program, but it would have been better to put forward the bolder program even if the Republicans had voted it down. Uh, and the bank rescue that Obama's team chose, that Obama agreed upon, that was something that was done administratively. It could have been very different. The politics of it could have been very different. And instead, 
you have a, ostensibly a liberal Democratic president who contrasts himself with the previous Republican administration being depicted with a fair degree of accuracy as the friend of Wall Street. So this was not good economics, and it was not at all uh, good politics. Uh, can the crisis be cured? Are there uh, paths out of this crisis that are economically feasible, even if, for now, uh, they're politically very uh, improbable? Uh, I think there are, but uh, unfortunately, all of them are outside of mainstream debate. And the only person with the power to bring them into mainstream debate, even if they're not enacted immediately, is the President of the United States. So we'll have to see whether uh, the shock of uh, a midterm election defeat will cause this President uh, to think more boldly. There was another uh, policy failure that could have been very different because um, it did not entirely require legislation. And that was the way that uh, the President and his team dealt with the mortgage crisis. Now, in the aftermath of uh, the mortgage crisis, uh, you have something like one home in three where the home is worth less than the debt uh, against it. And uh, Obama's uh, strategy for dealing with this was to come up with a voluntary program where the banks uh, would get uh, a payment of about $5,000 if they voluntarily agreed to uh, modify the terms of the mortgage so that the uh, debtor was not paying quite so much every month. Uh, the problem with this program is that it's not in the interest of the banks. It's more in the interest of the bank to carry that loan in its portfolio without booking the loss. And uh, as a result, you have had uh, 2.8 million foreclosures so far. You have another 8 million homeowners who are at risk of losing their homes, and only about 350,000 have gotten relief under this program, and of those, half of them are expected to go back into default. So here's a case where a major sector of the economy is functioning as an economic drag uh, in multiple ways. It's dragging down the balance sheet of banks. It's dragging down the uh, net worth of homeowners. It's causing a great deal of, uh, of pain and dislocation, and once again, it's not good politics because people who are suffering don't see this administration as uh, providing practical help. Uh, the, the alternative that was provided in the 1930s uh, through the Homeowners Loan Corporation was simply that the government refinanced mortgages at, at very low rates and about one homeowner in five in the 1930s uh, eventually uh, benefited uh, from this program. Now, it's true that the policies that Obama did pursue uh, averted the absolute worst. They averted a total economic collapse. It's true that without the stimulus, the unemployment rate would have been about three points worse, uh, GDP growth would have been lower, uh, and the administration complains that people don't give them enough credit, which is true. But the problem is that it could have been worse is not a very good election slogan. And uh, that's the, uh, the political trap that Mr. Obama is in. He also spent a great deal of energy and a great deal of political capital on one other policy that turned out to be uh, not a winner politically, and that was the health reform. Uh, Obama's uh, political team calculated early on that they probably would not have the votes to completely reorganize the health system. And as you know, we have a health system where uh, if you're old, you get Medicare. If you're poor, you get Medicaid. And if uh, you are in between, you might get insurance from your employer. You might not. You might have to purchase it privately, and you might be out of luck. Well, 85% of Americans do have health insurance, either through their employer, through Medicare, through Medicaid, through veterans' benefits, or just by purchasing it on the open market. So. Obama's program was only for 15% of the population, and ultimately it only helps about one-third of that 15%, 5% uh, 
uh, of the American uh, public. But because they made a strategic political decision not to get into a fight with the insurance industry, they do this program by subsidizing the industry uh, at the cost of about a half a trillion dollars over a decade. And the Republicans were very astute at frightening older voters that some of this money would come at the expense of Medicare, which is a very popular program. So Republicans, who have always been totally opposed to anything that smacks of government-run health insurance, ended up being cast as the defenders of Medicare, even though most Republicans voted against Medicare when it was enacted in 1964, and most Republicans have been in favor of privatizing it. That's how backwards uh, our politics have become. And the other thing they did was they added a mandate requiring people to have health insurance, which a lot of voters resent because a lot of the health insurance is not affordable. And the government subsidies are not big enough unless you're poor to make it affordable. So something that might have been a reform that restructured a whole system that's a very inefficient system. I mean, we spend 16% of GDP uh, on health care. We managed not to insure about 40 million people. And the typical OECD country spends about 9 or 10% and insures everybody. So we have a crazily inefficient system. Uh, the Obama reform did not go at the core sources of that inefficiency. It simply added subsidy to it so that about 5% more of the population could be uh, insured. And yet, the effort to get this thing through Congress uh, required a, a, a tremendous amount of political capital. So how do we allocate responsibility for Obama's uh, rather incomplete performance? How much of this was a result of choices that he made or his team made that he could have made differently? How much of it reflects the fact that this just was really hard? This is a very serious crisis. How much of it reflects Republican uh, obstructionism? And how much of it reflects Obama's own character and temperament and, and leadership qualities? Well, I think, to begin with, uh, he and his economic team underestimated how severe the crisis was and made some choices when they could have made other choices. Uh, it's certainly true that the Republicans made a decision early on that rather than try and compromise with Obama, they were going to try and block him at every step of the way and make it impossible uh, for him to succeed. And because of this uh, oddity in the American political system of the filibuster in the Senate, which has been really abused lately, uh, you have to have uh, 60 votes uh, to, uh, to get a bill through the Senate, without which you can't get it through Congress. And although there are uh, 60 uh, members of the Senate who caucus with the Democrats, two or three of them are notoriously uh, free spirits and uh, unreliable, so it's very difficult to get 60 votes. And a lot of very progressive legislation has passed the House uh, only to, uh, to die in the Senate. Now, that's not Obama's fault, although you could argue that if Obama had been a more persuasive leader, he could have made it more difficult for Republicans to obstruct his program. And that is what he is belatedly trying to do uh, less than two months. Uh, before uh, the midterm election. I think a very important factor was Obama's own character and temperament. Although it was clear from the beginning that the Republicans were not in a mood uh, to compromise, um, Obama continued to try to govern as a conciliator and consensus builder. And I think this habit is deeply ingrained in who he is. After all, he's the son of a black father from Kenya and a white mother from Kansas. And he has spent his entire life looking for areas of common ground, looking for ways to bridge difference. That's a noble enterprise. Unfortunately, it's just not possible uh, in these uh, political circumstances. And I think if you compare Obama with Roosevelt, which I've been doing, uh, it's both instructive, it's also a little bit unfair. Uh, for starters, when Roosevelt took office in March of 1933, uh, there was the, the Great Depression was already three and a half years old. 
Unemployment was 25%. And people were begging for emergency measures. When Obama took office in January of uh, 2009, the crisis was still deepening. That's a, that's a huge difference. Secondly, Roosevelt was a seasoned politician. He'd, all, he'd already been a successful governor of New York, and um, he uh, knew politics. Obama came to the White House with less experience than any American president since Abraham Lincoln. He had served in the Illinois State Senate, uh, which is kind of one step above the student council in terms of being uh, major league politics. Uh, he had only been in the U.S. Senate for two years when he began his campaign for president. And interestingly, he had never faced a serious Republican opponent in a general election until he faced John McCain. He, uh, he won a safe Democratic district for the state Senate, and he ran against somebody who was just a clown, who was not a serious candidate, just because two other candidates had self-destructed on personal scandals. So can you imagine never to have faced a serious opponent until you run for President of the United States? Actually, Hillary Clinton was the first opponent, serious opponent that he faced. But that's just uh, remarkable if you compare it with, with other politics. Uh, I also think that if history should judge Obama's presidency as a, as a missed opportunity, part of the reason will be a mismatch between Obama's strengths as a person and the hand that history dealt him. Imagine that he had been elected in 1993 and had faced a healthy economy and the set of issues that faced Bill Clinton. Uh, foreign policy challenges, human rights challenges, uh, anti-poverty challenges, or the challenges that faced uh, John Kennedy uh, a generation earlier. Again, uh, progress bridging racial divides, progress on civil rights and civil liberties and human rights, and uh, bringing a climate of detente uh, to the world. Obama, I think, would be very good at that. But the principal crisis that history handed him uh, was an economics crisis. Now, finally, to conclude, and uh, my, my hero, Professor Galbraith, used to say, you always have to say in conclusion to give the audience hope. Um, I think right now we face a real danger of an austerity crusade. Uh, and part of this uh, is worldwide, but part of this uh, is something that Obama needlessly did to himself. About a year ago, in order to demonstrate credibility uh, that he was not going to be profligate about the deficit, uh, his advisors persuaded him that it would be a good idea to appoint a commission on fiscal reform. And so he appointed an 18-member commission, 14 of whom are committed to austerity. Uh, that commission is due to report December 1st. And it's going to recommend very serious cuts in spending. It may uh, recommend increases in taxes if the Republicans can agree to do that. It's going to recommend uh, uh, some cuts in Social Security and Medicare. That's very difficult when you're president. If you're trying to get a recovery going and your own commission is about to uh, uh, recommend an austerity blueprint, to go uh, in a whole other direction. There's a whole campaign in the United States that's being orchestrated by something called the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, uh, which was given a, a billion dollars by one of Wall Street's most influential uh, investment bankers, polar opposite of George Soros, by the way. And Peterson's crusade for three decades has been to warn that Social Security and Medicare uh, are bankrupt bankrupting uh, the, the economy. So, Obama faces all of these pressures for uh, austerity. Uh, I think uh, an austerity program in the middle of a, uh, of a severe recession is obviously the worst thing you could do. Uh, no one said it better than Keynes. Uh, Keynes wrote uh, in 1937, you will never balance the budget through measures which reduce the national income. Look after unemployment and the budget will look after itself. Now history's great example uh, is World War II. Uh, in 1940, in the beginning of 1940, the unemployment rate in the United States was still 13.8 percent. And by 1942, unemployment was effectively zero. 
They were bringing people into the workforce who people thought were unemployable. Uh, how did they do that? Well, we rearmed, and Germany rearmed, and Britain rearmed, and uh, every country in Europe that was not overrun by the Nazis uh, rebuilt its economy by rearming. And um, anybody know what the deficit was as a percentage of GDP in 1942? It was 29%. Not the debt, the deficit, one year's deficit was 29% uh, of GDP. It averaged about 27% per year for the four years of the war. And at the end of the war, the, def the debt to GDP ratio, uh, if you take the public debt, it was about 112%. If you take the national debt, it was over 120%. And I'm sure the deficit hawks of that era were saying, well, we're, we're due for a crash. The, the economy can't possibly sustain that. But a funny thing happened. Um, all of that spending, as a byproduct of spending for armaments, recapitalized American industry, retrained American workers, restored the uh, health of uh, American uh, technology, and uh, we grew at a rate of about 12% a year for four years, and then we had a 25-year boom, a boom during which not only did we have growth averaging 3.8% a year, but the economy, the only time in the 20th century, uh, the economy steadily became more equal in the distribution of income uh, and wealth. And the debt, well, the economy grew faster than the debt, so that by the 1970s, uh, the debt ratio was back down to about 30% of GDP. Uh, in England, uh, since the Industrial Revolution, the average debt to GDP ratio has been about 140%. So if debt is invested productively, uh, debt per se uh, is not a menace. And when investors are willing to lend the United States government money for 30 years at about 4%, my advice would be take it, borrow. Uh, we uniquely are in the position of being able to incur debt in our own currency. And you say, well, but what about a crisis of confidence? What if the Chinese stop bar buying treasury bonds? And the answer is, uh, when you are at risk of deflation rather than inflation, it's actually okay to resort to the printing press. Uh, it's okay to uh, increase the money supply. Uh, now this is a view that uh, is not the consensus view in the White House. It's not the consensus view in Congress. But I think you need a much bigger short-term stimulus program, you need a much bigger uh, long-term investment program, you need a more assertive program to get banks back to the business of financing the real economy rather than enriching their own middleman. And uh, here's another uh, remarkably uh, appropriate quote by Keynes from June of 1940. That was a year and a half before the United States entered World War II. And Keynes said, it is, it seems, politically impossible for a capitalistic democracy to organize expenditure on a scale necessary to make the grand experiments which would prove my case, except in wartime. So here's the challenge for President Obama. Make the case to the American people and to the world that we have the tools to get a recovery going without the war. The benefit of doing it without the war is all of the things that would be blown up, you can actually invest in useful things. And there is uh, no one else who can make that case. Uh, I think that kind of uh, far-sighted program of public investment, reconstruction of the financial system, is the only way out of this mess. It's not yet mainstream politics, but uh, President Obama can make it mainstream politics, and I hope he does. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. Now the floor is open to questions. Yes. Uh, uh, first was a gentleman yeah, over there, and then a uh, student from Mexico, please. This is a very naive question, but I am simply astonished at the, uh, the uh, nastiness, if that's the word, of 
publicans, can you, can you in some way explain what the motivation is, why the Republicans have been so He's from the local backward the, uh, the office comes. And, uh, I mean, obviously I'm not a Republican. Right. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, political scientists were saying, if only we had ideologically coherent parties like Europe does. Well, they got their wish. And uh, the problem is that all of the ideological ferocity is on one side. Uh, the Democrats are a very moderate party. You know, they're about where the German CDU is, maybe not quite as liberal uh, in, the, in the American sense, but the Republicans have become an ideologically coherent parliamentary style party with a great deal of party discipline and a lot of ferocity uh, in the part of their, their most vocal base. Um, why is this so? Well, I think there are a lot of frustrated people who don't like the direction that the society has taken. <laughs> After all, you've had 30 years of stagnant uh, wages for white men. This has been a period when women and African Americans have belatedly uh, had opportunities given to them, uh, not given to them, they had to organize to get the opportunities. But the privilege that um, a lot of working class white men enjoyed simply because they weren't blacks and they weren't women uh, has been taken away. And there's a lot of resentment of that. Secondly, I think there's a lot of resentment of uh, secular uh, values. Um, it used to be that um, the, the, the Jeffersonian ideal was that the state would stay out of religion Religion was a private affair. Um, I think in the past 30 years, um, the popular culture, uh, Hollywood movies, television programs, um, political radicals have been less respectful of religion, and there's been a backlash. There's been a ferocious backlash on the part of fundamentalist uh, religions. I think there's also uh, a politics of resentment against immigrants. Uh, if someone comes to the United States, it's very similar to what's going on in Europe, is desperate for work and is willing to do your job at a lower wage. Uh, if you're economically vulnerable anyway, it makes you very angry. And I think the Democrats, unlike in the Roosevelt period, have not addressed that economic frustration because they haven't delivered very much to working class voters. Uh, things have gotten worse for working class voters. And so the cultural right has made gains by defining issues in cultural terms more than in economic terms. Uh, guns, God, and gays, uh, as is often said. Uh, and that creates not only a far right base, but it creates a very highly motivated base. And little by little by little, that base uh, has become more influential in the Republican Party to the point where uh, the only real difference between the mainstream Republican Party and the so-called Tea Party is that the Tea Parties are at a higher level of anger. But it's pretty much the same policies. So it's an incomplete uh, explanation, but the result is that you've got one ideologically zealous, politically disciplined party, and one party that's more centrist, uh, more all over the place ideologically. Um, one wing of it is in bed with Wall Street, the other wing of it is involved with organized labor, and uh, it doesn't, Democrats, don't quite have as coherent a message as, uh, as the Republicans do. There was a moment when Obama pulled this together and mobilized both the base and the independents, and that moment's passed. So the question is, can he get it back? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Very interesting uh, Thank lecture. You. Thank you very much. I'm Rodrigo from Mexico. I consider myself a strong supporter of Obama. When I discuss with my friends that uh, criticize him strongly, I argue that they are confusing the emperor with the empire. I don't think, uh, I believe in his goodwill, in uh, his intention to transform like this uh, very shameful hegemon that was the US under uh, Bush presidencies into a respectable hegemon. But I wonder, uh, seeing all the economic and political interests, distribution of coalitions, if you will, from
from the oil and army industry, Wall Street, the National Rifle Association, to Glenn Beck's, Glenn Beck, Fox News, and the Tea Party. To what extent can this emperor transform the empire? So in short, my question is, given the structural constraints of the US political economy, how high should the over expectations of the transformative power of this enlightened presidency should be, or should we expect, or do you expect something more on the surface? Well, it's the perfect question. And the structural barriers are very, very high. The, the power of the political opposition and the media opposition is very high, and the substantive difficulty of curing this crisis is very great. So uh, that said, uh, I think he could have done some things differently. And you can always say that looking backwards, but some of us were saying it at the time. Uh, I think in some ways he was more effective as a candidate in terms of his leadership than he is as president. It's easier to be a candidate than it is to govern. Uh, you know, have, have most of you seen the movie The Wizard of Oz? You know, there's a, there's a moment at the end where the, where, where the wizard is unmasked and Dorothy says, you're a very bad man. And he says, no, I'm just not a very good wizard. And uh, uh, I think Obama is a very good man. I admire him as a man as much as I did the day I voted for him with tears in my eyes. But um, it's not yet clear how good a wizard he is. And the system is so messed up and the opposition is so great that to surmount the crisis, you, you almost need that kind of magical uh, power. And yet Roosevelt, I mean, I keep comparing Obama to Roosevelt, even though it's totally unfair. Uh, you know, in 1936, uh, at, at uh, a rally at Madison Square Garden in New York, um, when the Republicans in Wall Street were, were just calling Roosevelt every name in the book, he said, uh, they hate me and I welcome their hatred. And that rallied people. You can't imagine Barack Obama saying, they hate me and I welcome their hatred. He's, he's very damped down. He's very, he's the whitest black guy in America, you know? <laughs> he's very aloof. He's very, he's a professor. And you, <laughs> you need somebody in a circumstance like this who's more of a fighter. And it breaks my heart to criticize this man. Uh, but so much is riding on whether he succeeds. I think it's still possible for him to succeed. I don't think it's over. Um, but if he fails, we are in for a very prolonged period of economic suffering, and uh, we are in for a right-wing government that's further to the right, you know, that's going to make Reagan look moderate. And both of these are almost too painful to contemplate, so I think Knowing how to criticize your friends without being overly harsh on your friends is very difficult. It's very, very difficult to do. No one likes to be criticized. And I hope my comments are in a constructive spirit. So uh, uh, I'm glad you're defending Obama to your friends. I hope you'll also point out some of the things that he might have done differently. And John? Um, just, Bob, that was a superb lecture, and I thank you for it. And I think you, you have uh, certainly helped uh, our faculty and students and guests understand the very complicated workings of the American political system right now and how heavily the deck is stacked against Obama, as well as some of the things that Obama himself has done to stack the deck against him. But I want to look ahead uh, 55 days and, and put you on the spot. Uh, yeah. We have a uh, prognosticator as well as a an analyst here, and I want to ask Bob to not only tell us, as you already have, about your expectations regarding losses in the House and the Senate, which are, um, which are going to be, in your view, less serious but serious than some of the predictions. But I, I, want, I want you to then uh, put yourself in Obama's place. Um, and if history is a guide here, uh, if we go back to 1994, where President Clinton lost very large uh, percentage, a very large number of seats in the House and the Senate. In some ways, the issue was somewhat the same because it was the health care failure, as you described it. And this, the only incentive that Clinton had from that point forward in his presidency was an incentive to survive and move to the center. 
um, help us understand how Obama could survive and move into a much bolder uh, situation, in, notwithstanding all the political uh, hurdles that he faces? Well, it's a good question. Uh, I, I think he will do one of two things. He will either move to the center, and if the Republicans uh, control one house, or if they block everything that he does, then uh, some of the responsibility is theirs. It can't all be blamed uh, on him, because I don't see any way that the economy is going to be in good shape, um, particularly if, if the Democrats lose their working majority. I don't see any way that we're going to have a real recovery in time for the election of 2012 when he's up for, for re-election. So either he moves to the center and tries to find areas of common ground with the Republicans that could help the economy. I mean, he could agree uh, on a very, very large tax cut. The problem is that the Republicans, I mean, the, the Republicans' views are very contradictory in many ways. They're, they're for a large tax cut, but they're also for a reduction in the deficit. Uh, they're, they're against Wall Street, but they're also against regulation. Uh, they're, they're libertarians, but they also, you know, want the country to be a theocracy. Um, so how do you compromise with these people? Now, if, if um, you could get an agreement with the Republicans to have a very large tax cut, I don't think that would be as good as infrastructure spending, but I think it might be somewhat stimulative. Um, so you, you could see him uh, being more centrist. I think the other thing you could see him do, and this is what Harry Truman did in 1948, he could send legislation that he thinks is necessary to cure the economic situation. He could send up bolder legislation and let them defeat it, let them block it, and then hold them accountable for blocking it and uh, clarify the, the differences instead of muddling the differences. I think those are the two uh, strategic choices. And I think, um, of course, Clinton, Clinton survived for a few reasons. Uh, one, the economy was in very, very good shape. So he didn't really need the Republicans to do very much. Um, secondly, when the Republicans tried to play really tough with him uh, and shut down the government by refusing to pass the, the, the budget, he faced them down. And, and he looked strong and they look weak. Thirdly, the one substantive area of compromise that he did with the Republicans after 94 was welfare reform, which, which was, I mean, it was too harsh, but it removed from contention an issue that had been very toxic uh, for Democrats. And then fourth, he got very, very lucky in 96 because he drew one of the weakest opponents in American politics. Robert Dole was just a very feeble candidate. So, you know, the Republicans might be so far right by 2012, uh, and they might nominate God knows who, uh, <laughs> that Obama, despite a terrible recovery, could still win. I'm not sure that's, that's much comfort. I mean, I, I would like to see Obama win as a progressive, and I'd like to see Obama win as someone who produced a recovery rather than someone who, who uh, limped into a second term. Uh, before we give uh, to you the question, any comment about foreign policy and the softness of the yeah. policy? Well, what I really want to talk about is, uh, is uh, foreign policy is not my expertise. And my mother always said, don't talk about things you don't know about. Um, but I would like to talk about uh, the Europe, the, the, the contrast between differences and similarities between um, the European economic situation and austerity politics in Europe and in the United States. May, may I address that question? <clears throat> or why don't I wait and take some more questions? I'll come back to that last because that's really my own question and you get to ask questions. Okay, so there was a gentleman, yeah, at the end. Um, it seems uh, hard, at least for me to believe, that large scale government spending would have the same revitalizing effect in 2010 on American industry as it did in 1942. Uh, just for the reason that today so many American industries are putting their jobs overseas. So it's as if we could give these companies more contracts instead of building the new factories in Detroit, as they did in 1942, we would open in Thailand or Mexico or, or other countries. I'm wondering how you increase employment in America when the, the average American worker demands so much more in terms of pay benefits as overseas workers and new technologies put 
Well, um, it's a very good question. Uh, I, I think if you look at the candidates for infrastructure spending, <clears throat> a lot of that either has to be domestic or it could be domestic. I mean, for instance, uh, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, we have an accumulated deficit of $3.2 trillion in just basic public infrastructure, Thing like, things like water and sewer systems and bridges and highways and railroad beds. So those jobs uh, are domestic jobs. They're, they're, they're good jobs. They're not at the very top of, of the pay scale, but they're, but they're good uh, jobs. Uh, and I think if we were not afraid of the idea of having an industrial policy, you could take something like high-speed rail and, uh, and use it to uh, rebuild uh, supply chains. And not every one of those jobs would be in the United States. You, you, you wouldn't want to do that because there are some things that are procured more efficiently from overseas. But uh, for instance, uh, we used to have a domestic uh, uh, industry in this country that supplied, uh, in, not this country, this is Hungary, but in the United States, that provided trolleys, trams, uh, subway cars, subway systems. We, we don't have that anymore. And so you get into this very tricky question of whether it's appropriate when the taxpayer spends money to have a local content requirement. Every other country in the world does it. China certainly does it. Japan does it. Korea does it. When they do deals with American companies, the, the condition of the deal is that most of the content be uh, assembled or manufactured locally. So I think we have nothing to apologize for if we have a stimulus program that includes local content requirements. So yeah, some of the, some of the stimulus would leak uh, into, uh, into jobs that are created overseas. That's fine. Uh, one hopes that if the Chinese uh, start paying workers in proportion to their productivity, then the Chinese start buying more stuff from us. Here's a statistic. Um, consumption, wages, and, and uh, household consumption, it bounces around, but it's about 72, 73% in the United States. In China, it's 32%. Uh, it's gone down in recent years from 38%. So the Chinese economy is structured so that uh, so much of the uh, productivity in China is reinvested in, in back into production, doesn't go into consumption. If you give the, the Chinese worker a bit of a break and pay him a little bit better, or her, uh, and you are less of a mercantilist economy, then you're buying more stuff from the West, and it's okay if the West, uh, you know, uh, outsources some jobs to China. Now, eventually that's going to equilibrate, but by the time it does, uh, we could be a very uh, poor, uh, society, and uh, you, you really see the dramatic difference between the United States and, say, Germany, where Germany still has a manufacturing economy. Germany cares whether it has a manufacturing economy. It has the highest paid workers in the world, and it has the largest export surplus relative to GDP in the world, uh, even larger than China's, because they still make things that people want to buy. So I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of for the United States to say, hey, we could do that. But that requires an industrial policy, and that's another one of those policies that's outside the mainstream consensus that ought to be brought back in. Uh, the gentleman in the red. Yeah. Richard. Hello. Um, uh, it's a privilege to listen to your uh, speech. Thank you for a wonderful speech. Uh, I have two questions, one on uh, the financial system in the United States and the other on a bit on foreign <coughs> policy. And the first one is, uh, I don't know if you remember, And it was the time when uh, the CEOs had a huge party and had huge, huge bonuses when the senators were working in the Senate for an emergency bail bailout. And uh, Jay Leno asked, shouldn't someone go to jail? And Obama said basically something like, uh, well, they were legal. All the, all, all the bailout, all the bonuses they are getting, the golden parachutes, they were all legal. And he promised there would be some change. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could expand on that, uh, what has changed since uh, he took office. And, 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 and on a similar note, uh, about you ended your speech with the war. I was wondering, don't you think the uh, United States should hurdle a lot more money that is spent
them on board and instead uh, use it at home. I know Obama uses the rhetoric of doing it, but where is the chance? Because he never, he never um, promoted Afghanistan as a dumb war. He always said Iraq is a dumb war, and he promised during the campaign drill he would he would finish up in the the war. But he, but it took two years to finish up Iraq. When would Afghanistan? Well, uh, let me answer the second question first. Yes. I mean, a lot of military spending could be reprogrammed to uh, domestic spending. That would be good in foreign policy terms. It would also be good uh, for the economy. Um, the, the financial reform that was passed was very partial. Uh, other than Bernard Madoff, uh, who was you know, an out-and-out -out swindler, the more subtle swindlers uh, have not gone to jail. And uh, even though there were all kinds of misrepresentations made, um, the, uh, the administration, the Justice Department, has not chosen to uh, use uh, criminal prosecutions. Uh, in the savings and loan scandal of the 1980s, uh, almost 1,000 people went to jail. So uh, I think in terms of structural reforms, um, the, the bill that uh, finally passed Congress uh, was helpful in some respects, but it leaves the basic business model of the shadow banking system intact. There's a little more disclosure. Uh, the regulators have a better handle to some extent on, on capital requirements, uh, but too big to fail, that didn't change. Um, real control over abuses in, uh, in complex derivatives, mm, partial progress. So. Um, I don't think this is going to happen again for a while because they're so risk averse, but I think the, the excessive size and complexity uh, of the financial industry is still a problem. It's still a huge problem, and the bonuses are, are all back. Wall Street is just making a ton of money. So I think uh, we, we missed that opportunity to really uh, reform the system. Yeah. Yeah. One question and the second, and then we'll give you the last word. So please, gentlemen. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure how to ask this, but I'm just going to ask this to get a feeling out of you. Um, let's say one believes it as I do, but nothing's going to happen in the next five years that's any, going to make any real difference uh, to, to these really structural problems. What I'm wondering is on our side of the fence, um, if, if, you know, the right at this point in their fortunes formed ideological think tanks, they took a really strong position. I, I don't sense that at this point. What I'm wondering is, let's say you believe, as I do, that five or ten years from now, the only way to ever solve this problem is we have to have a strong program, nationalize the banks, strong industrial policy, not just local content or something, shoving a lot of capital towards clean energy, economic revolution, uh, you know, single-payer health insurance. All. Is there anything going on now in America, or is there any group of school of people who think, I think I'd be pretty much like you do uh, on this side of things, about how to start a real initiative so that it won't be possible now, can't happen in the next five years. I well remember William Buckley telling me that uh, five years before Reagan took office that, that America was a socialist and conservatives could never do anything. Is there any chance, is, is there any group among us on the left or whatever who are thinking of these really structural, who will be ready next time when there's a crisis to actually come up with, uh, who will build some sort of consensus for these ideas? I'm just feeling like well, it's a good question. Um, they, they were ready this time. I mean, there are left of center think tanks who were putting forward exactly the kind of program you're talking about. I work with some of them. Uh, Economic Policy Institute, Campaign for America's Future. Um, the Progressive Caucus in Congress, in the House, is about 90 people. So that's the political strength in the House of Representatives of about uh, out of 435, you've got 90, who were basically European Social Democrats, uh, old-fashioned European Social Democrats, not, not Blair, not Schroeder, but uh, actual, you know, Swedish or Danish-style Social Democrats. Uh, so what's that? That's, uh, that's maybe one-fifth of the Congress. But that's not nothing. Uh, you've got probably 25 people in the Senate, maybe 30 on a good day who believe in those policies. I think the, the single-payer bill uh, that, uh, that Congressman Conyers filed, I think had uh, something like 120 people in the House signed on to it. So 
you know, Buckley used the word remnant, William Buckley. He talked about a remnant of conservatives who you would build on and you'd build a movement. So there's certainly more than a remnant of progressives. But what frustrates me is you have a moment when the right has totally disgraced itself, both the governing right and the uh, right in the economics profession, meaning the ultra-free market, market fundamentalist right. You have a president who's a complete outsider. So you have this rendezvous where you know, drastic change should have been possible, and yet it didn't happen. And that goes to the question of our friend from Mexico about just how serious the structural barriers are. They're, they're very, very, very powerful. And uh, one of the discouraging things is that you do have mass movements in the United States, but most of them on the right. Uh, the labor movement's very weak. And so to the extent that you need uh, popular activity to offset elite activity, uh, I think people's reaction to this crisis is mostly fear, and uh, the, the ideology of individualism uh, has had such success that people are looking out for themselves and their families rather than thinking politically about how do we change the rules of the system. Too many people. The German student from business school. Uh, maybe a, a bit simpler and, and shorter. When shall all debt be repaid? If there's a big you know, public spending program now, should we decline now? When and who repays, or should it be left to infinity? Well, Will Republicans happily repay what the Democrats spend? Well, the debt, the debt doesn't get repaid. It gets rolled over. But the important figure is what is the ratio of debt to GDP? And when you have a depression, the ratio of debt to GDP should go up because that's the only way you're going to get out of a depression. And then when you have a period of recovery, you have much smaller deficits and uh, the debt to GDP comes down. So as long as the debt to GDP it is not so large that you're consuming a very big fraction of tax receipts on interest payments, um, and you know maybe that's under 100, you know, 100. I, I think above 100 percent of GDP, it starts getting problematic. But we have plenty of room to incur more debt, and I think the period after World War II is very instructive because you had a huge debt, but the economy grew faster than the debt, and so the debt ratio came down. And I think that's the way to look at it. I just want to say one word about Europe before I close. I mean, um, in some ways, Europe's situation is much stronger, and in some ways, it's much more alarming. It's stronger because Europe has roughly balanced trade accounts with the rest of the world, and Europe, for the most part, finances its own national debt. So those are two sources of strength that uh, America doesn't have. Uh, Europe's financial system, with a few exceptions, Britain uh, and a couple of other continental banks, did not take as big a hit as America's because they didn't go in for these abusive financial instruments quite as much as the United States did. On the other hand, um, the EU and the Eurozone is a potential real Achilles heel. Uh, and you see this with uh, Greece and Portugal and uh, and maybe Hungary, uh, where uh, small countries that uh, get into economic difficulty, mostly uh, as a byproduct of somebody else's economic difficulty, find themselves at the mercy of international uh, finance. And um, I've been referring to Keynes. I mean, in 1944, at the Bretton Woods meetings, uh, they invented the IMF so that this wouldn't happen so that international finance would, would, would no longer control the fate of, of entire economies and so that the system would be biased in favor of growth instead of austerity. And over half a century, the International Monetary Fund mutated into its opposite. Instead of becoming a counterweight to of private finance, it became the collection agency uh, for private finance. And so uh, I don't know how closely you followed this, but. Uh, after the Latin American debt crisis of the, of the 70s and 80s, uh, a Republican Secretary of the Treasury named Nicholas Brady came up with something called the Brady Plan. And the idea of the Brady Plan was to uh, trade short-term debt for longer-term debt to make the banks uh, take some of a hit, and um, we got out of that crisis. 
why isn't somebody in Europe like the ECB or the Paris Club or uh, the IMF proposing a Brady Plan for Greece uh, and Portugal and, and other countries where uh, there's no way that Greece can get out of the dilemma that it's in by tightening its belt. And if you have an austerity program, uh, all that means is that you have less capacity to pay back the debt. It's very much like Keynes's criticism of the Versailles settlement, where the reparations that were extracted from West Germany by France and Britain uh, at the Versailles Paris, uh, Peace Conference of 1919 guaranteed that Germany would never recover and that uh, Europe would be stuck in a post-war recession and that we'd probably have a second world war. Uh, Greece and Ireland and uh, Portugal are being put in the same position because of the lack of foresight and statesmanship. Uh, it's harder in Europe because you do have this division between uh, the European Central Bank, na national governments, and the EU government. Uh, and I think the stakes are so high that even though nobody likes it, <clears throat> I expect that uh, European statesmen will, will rise to the occasion because the alternative is too horrible to contemplate, but there's no guarantee that this will happen. So, you know, I end on the note that I started on leadership. Leadership uh, really matters. It matters on both sides of the Atlantic, and uh, we need to see more of it. Thank you very much. See you next time.